wahrhaftige Weltanschauungspartei sein. Und zweitens, Sie wollen, Herr, jeder soll helfen. Ich sage nur so viel, wenn ich das Wort Kultur höre, dann greife ich schon nach meinem Revolver. In 1938, March the 12th, Hitler annexes Austria and makes it a part of Nazi Germany. September 30th, British Prime Minister Neville Chamberlain signs a peace treaty with Hitler. And the Anglo-German naval agreement, as symbolic of the desire of our two peoples never to go to war with one another again. 1939, March 15th, the Nazis invade Czechoslovakia. August 23rd, Hitler and Stalin sign a non-aggression pact which states that the great powers of Germany and Russia wouldn't go to war with each other. September 1st, Hitler invades Poland, conquering it in less than four weeks. By September 10th, France, Britain and its Commonwealth all declare war on Germany. America remains neutral. 1940, April the 9th, the Nazis invade Denmark and Norway. Denmark would fall within six hours. Norway bravely fights back, but ultimately surrenders on June the 10th, 1940. May 10th, Hitler invades France, Belgium, Luxembourg and the Netherlands. Within a month, all would surrender to Germany, except France. Also on this day, Winston Churchill becomes Prime Minister of the UK. June the 14th, the Nazis march into Paris. Although he wanted to keep fighting, French Prime Minister Renault is outnumbered by those who want to make a deal with Hitler and is forced to resign. In his place, the 84-year-old Marshal Pétain is appointed the new Prime Minister of France. June 22nd, Germany and France sign an armistice deal. In a supreme act of revenge, Hitler chooses the same location and rail carriage where the Germans signed the treaty ending World War I. Under the terms of the deal, Germany now occupies northern and western France. Two million French soldiers are taken as prisoners of war and put into work camps. France also agrees to pay 400 million francs per day to fund the German occupation. With the Nazis occupying Paris, the French government moved to the city of Vichy in central France. The new French state would thus come to be known simply as Vichy. Vichy, which is allied to the Nazis, controls non-occupied France and French North Africa. France was defeated on the mainland in May June 1940. France was completely overrun in six weeks and an armistice was made with Germany. But France wasn't just France, it had an empire. It had an empire in Africa, it had an empire in the Middle East. And some people thought that the, the war should continue from the empire, and in particular the nearest part of the empire, which was French North Africa. Parliament basically decided to hand full powers to Marshal Pétain to, to make a new constitution. That was the beginning of the Vichy regime, which was an authoritarian government. Under Vichy, the Liberté, Égalité, Fraternité was, was changed into 
travail, famille, patrie, labor, family, and fatherland. And there was, that was the great rhetoric. Well, in 1942, uh, France was squeezed between uh, Germany, which had occupied it, and which was fighting a desperate war with the Soviet Union and therefore clamping down very heavily on France to, to eradicate uh, dissent and resistance. On the other hand, the British and the Americans. The Americans hadn't quite come into the war yet, but they were squeezing France from the other side. The Vichy regime, which was controlling France, was collaborating with the Germans. But you did also have the Free French under de Gaulle, and they were active. France in 1942 was in a very, very difficult uh, position. My first experience with the Algerian Jewish resistance was through uh, this book that was written by uh, an Israeli woman. I came across this um, remarkable story of what happened in Algiers. The role that the Jewish resistance of Algiers played in assisting the Allied invasion in Operation Torch. And the, uh, the, the unique experience of the Jews of Algiers, um, unique in many respects, unique in organizing themselves, um, unique in changing the course of the war. I had never heard of this before. Um, I had never heard of any organized uh, Jewish resistance in the entire North African theater. Um, one doesn't read about this in uh, books of, uh, uh, of Jewish resistance during World War II in general, and I dug deeper. Resistance fighters were, first of all, they were resisting the armistice of 1940. I mean, France had dropped out of the war. There was a small minority of people who said that the war was not over. A battle was, had been lost, but the war was not over, and they were continuing to fight, and they fought alongside the Free French and General de Gaulle. But a lot of resistors were Jews, communists, foreigners, because they were particularly uh, oppressed. They were rounded up, put in camps. So the Jews would obviously be deported. People were also resisting the Vichy regime, which clamped down on dissent. And so people resisted for a variety of reasons. C'était des gens jeunes. Ils, la plupart avaient entre 18 et, et 30 et quelques années, et qui avaient un élan an espèce de patriotisme. By and large, these were young Jewish Frenchmen who were motivated to act because of the unique persecution that they suffered as Jews. Denied school, denied jobs, denied where they could live, denied citizenship because they were Jews. The Jewish community in, in Algeria had become citizens in 1870. The Muslims were rarely French citizens, but the Jewish community en bloc was made citizens. Vichy passed a decree which deprived them of citizenship. So, so they're a pariah group. They're not only a pariah group, a persecuted group, but their future had disappeared. Looking through the lens of today, one doesn't appreciate the extent to which Algerian Muslim authorities, religious authorities, worked side by side with the Jewish community in Algiers, protesting the imposition of Vichy laws. Um, uh, they, they were opposed to what um, uh, Vichy was doing to persecute the local Jews. Leaders of the Muslim community, leaders of the Algerian nationalist community publicly said, we take no joy in seeing what is happening to the Jews. What's happening to the Jews is what's happening today. First, it'll be the Jews. Tomorrow, it will be us. The Jewish community in Algiers also knew the bigger, darker story about what was going on in Europe. Look, for example, at the Von C document, the, the, the conference held by the Nazi high command to determine the details of the final solution. Look at the list of all the Jewish populations that were to be exterminated by the Nazis. Look at the number ascribed for the number of French Jews. What is the number given? The number is 700,000. How many Jews lived in France at the time? 
perhaps 200,000. That 700,000 number only makes sense if you include the Moroccan Jews, the Algerian Jews, and the Tunisian Jews. These Jewish communities were viewed as targets by the Nazis. Everyone knew about the terrible persecution of Jews in Nazi and Vichy-controlled Europe. They knew it was coming to them. They could see it, they could feel it. They knew this was their future. Je savais qui était le professeur Aboulker, connu comme neurochirurgien, et puis compagnon de la Libération, à 23 ans, qui est quand même important. Aboulker was the local leader of the Jewish resistance movement. He's the medical student at the time, about 20 years old. He is the son of one of the leading lights of the Algiers Jewish community, a very well-respected physician. Henri was a professor at the faculty of, of Algiers. He was a Jewish activist. He was a radical socialist politician. Le père de José Abouquet était professeur de médecine. Il ne pouvait plus aller à l'hôpital. Eh bien, il recevait chez lui à domicile, remichelait tous les gens qui avaient besoin de le voir. José was a highly intelligent young man. Uh, he was well connected. Uh, he was a great networker. Uh, he was very politically astute. Hitler, n'en parle pas, lui avait lu en Algérie. Il avait vu ce texte traduit et ça avait mis en rage. He himself is uh, an organizer. He himself is the, um, uh, is the link between the Jewish resistance movement and sort of the higher ranks of the overall Algerian resistance. And in the long frame of history, I mean, he was the leader of this uh, insurrection of the 8th of uh, November 1942, which coincided with the torch landing. Vous pouvez trouver des hommes pour monter ces mouvements de résistance? Eh bien, euh, nous les avons trouvés dans leur majorité parmi les Juifs algériens. Pour des raisons évidentes, Pour eux, la lutte contre Hitler était une lutte pour la vie. Et en plus d'eux, il y a eu un certain nombre de pieds noirs qui ont été assez courageux pour rompre avec leur milieu et venir avec nous. Il y a eu un groupe de policiers patriotes autour d'André Achiari. Il y a eu aussi quelques officiers, pas très nombreux, mais l'un d'eux, le colonel Jousse, a joué un rôle décisif dans notre succès. Et enfin, il y a eu tout un groupe de métropolitains qui étaient venus de France en Algérie après la défaite pour continuer la lutte. Et il y avait surtout euh, Henri Dastier de la Ligue. Il était surtout l'homme qui était une espèce de d'archange. C'est un mot qui est assez prostitué aujourd'hui. Mais à l'époque, c'était vraiment le, le glaive, l'archange avec le glaive. Bel Et homme, par conséquent. Bel homme, merveilleux, beau. Séduisant d'une grande finesse. Il avait un pétillement dans le regard qui était absolument étonnant. C'était un chef. Henri Dastier, Henri Dastier de la Vigerie, a rather uh, exotic aristocratic name. He was, one of, he was one of three brothers, Henri, François and Emmanuel. He was a royalist. He was an oddity because, you know, France had been a republic since 1870 and, and, and the royalists were a bit uh, curious, they were a bit out on a limb, they hated the French Republic and they wanted to bring back the monarchy. But although he was kind of right wing, he was not the same as Vichy and Pétain, he wanted to continue the war. He was in danger of arrest in 1941, he decided to go to, uh, to Algiers. He was a, an eccentric figure, but a key figure and, uh, and, a, and a linking figure between the, the, these groups of resistors, which were very disparate. And the only thing they had in common was this idea that North Africa should be brought into the war against the Axis powers. Nineteen forty one, June twenty second, Germany attacks the Soviet Union. The world is shocked since Hitler and Stalin, just two years prior, had formed an alliance. August the fourteenth. 
Churchill and Roosevelt meet for the first time, in secret, off the coast of Newfoundland. Churchill unsuccessfully tries to coerce Roosevelt to join the war effort. This would be the first of 11 meetings between the two leaders. September 29th, Babi Yar. The first mass killing of Jews at the hands of the Nazis occurs in Kiev, Ukraine. As over 33,000 Jews are massacred by machine gun fire over two days in the Babi Yar ravine. December the 7th, the Japanese bomb Pearl Harbor. The next day, the US and Britain declare war on Japan. Three days later, Hitler declares war on America. December the 22nd, the Arcadia Conference. With America now officially entering the war, the top military commanders of Britain and the United States meet for 23 days to craft a coordinated wartime strategy. Germany first is agreed upon as being the best way forward. Thus the first and most important goal is to defeat Nazi Germany. An assault on North Africa is proposed by the British, but initially opposed by the Americans. Churchill would not give up on this plan, and eventually his vision would become known as Operation Torch. Operation Torch is essential to the war in Europe and the Mediterranean. It's the first blow, the first Anglo-American blow against the Germans and the Italians. And in many ways, it's the essential first step on the road first to Rome and then ultimately to Berlin. From Torch follows the invasion of Sicily, then the invasion of Italy at Salerno, Anzio, southern France, and Normandy. And the techniques initially pioneered in Torch will play a very important role in those invasions and making those invasions, further invasions, successful. The Americans wanted to invade France in 1943, and they would have been doing it with a, an army that was completely inexperienced. The British managed to almost to cajole the Americans into going to French North Africa instead, while the American High Command tended to think that it was almost a waste. They thought it had pushed back the defeat of Germany almost a whole year. It did allow the American Army to get badly needed combat experience and operational experience. Operation Torch is very significant in world history because it's the longest invasion ever mounted in the history of the world. The so three invasion convoys, two from the United Kingdom and one directly here from Norfolk and Hampton Roads in Virginia, each traveled about 2,800 miles to get to their beaches in Iran and Algiers. The one that aimed directly for Morocco sailed from the United States 4,500 miles across the Atlantic. There was never anything that had ever been attempted like that before in modern military history. There was never anything like it afterwards. In terms of the ability of the Allies to be able to move that many troops to the right place at the right time over that distance, um, speaks volumes about what the potential was and what the power they were able to bring to bear to start defeating Germany and Italy. Torch was kind of an, an accident. The Americans thought it was completely the wrong thing to do and they never really got over it. It was the first large joint operation between the Americans and the British and one of the major success stories for the Allies, I think, is how well the Americans and the British worked together and integrated, even though they didn't see eye to eye as much as it might seem. An invasion of North Africa had been on the books for the Western Allies, had been under consideration since January of 1942. The Americans and the British get together and start figuring out how are we gonna fight Germany because Germany first is the essential allied strategy. We're gonna beat the Germans, they're the priority first. The Americans believe the best way to do that is to go for the jugular, go across the channel into France in 1942 and begin to fight the German army however long and however bloody it takes. The British, who were already engaged with the Germans in North Africa, particularly in Egypt at this point against Rommel's Africa Corps, believe that the best way to approach this is to start by going through the Mediterranean, knocking out the Italians, taking care of kind of the southern flank of Europe, if you will, and securing that essential area, and then going across the channel. What ensues over the spring and summer of 1942 is what's been termed the transatlantic essay contest as they go back and forth. Torch is an essential test of the Anglo-American alliance. 
because if they can't get this operation, this complex operation involving troop convoys from the United Kingdom and the United States coming together all at the same time with lightning precision, if they can't do that in November of 42, they're not going to be able to do it again in the Mediterranean in 1943 or crossing the English Channel to Normandy in 1944. Churchill was really the perfect wartime leader. He was quite bullish. He had a strong sense of where the nation needed to be at critical moments throughout the Second World War. He was quite enigmatic and charismatic. And largely due to him, I think, that uh, Britain held out. And of course, he's very well known for his famous speeches. We shall defend our island, whatever the cost may be. We shall fight. Landing ground, in fields, in streets, and on the hills, we shall never surrender. Well, Churchill realised that, you know, this tiny island had been fighting and struggling in 1940. But ultimately, the war could not be won and the invasion of the mainland without the support and the physical forces of America. I mean, we managed to hold out in Britain for long enough, but ultimately we couldn't have mounted those huge campaigns and the war wouldn't have, I don't believe, ended in 1945 without the Americans. So that relationship was absolutely crucial. It's not only the commanders working together, but the intelligence services, the planners. It was a massive operation behind the scenes. I think Churchill got on very well with, with Roosevelt. I mean, they were both fighters. Roosevelt was an immensely powerful person. He was elected four times president of the United States. Initially, he was reluctant to bring America into the war, the United States into the war. But, you know, Churchill worked on him a great deal. Here is the answer which I will give to President Roosevelt. Put your confidence in us. Give us your faith and your blessing, and under providence, all will be well. We shall not fail or falter. Give us the tools, and we will finish the job. Finally, George Marshall, the US Army Chief of Staff, has to go to President Franklin Roosevelt and say, we were at an impasse, and the British do not want to support going across the channel. I'm not interested in going to the Mediterranean. I think it's a sideshow from the main effort to go to Berlin. Let's uh, reorient our, or our operations to the Pacific. Roosevelt says, that's like picking up our dishes and going home. And we're not gonna do that. And so he sends Marshall and the Chief of Naval Operations, Ernest King, back to London and says, work out a deal. We're gonna go to North Africa. Roosevelt knows we have to fight the Germans and the Italians somewhere in 1942. We have to get the army engaged, particularly with visions of Dunkirk, which is only two years in the past, with visions of World War I. It could very easily bog down into a stalemate. We have to have a success when we go after them. North Africa is the place to do it. Eisenhower was fairly junior. He wasn't a very popular choice, but he had the advantage that George Marshall, the Army Chief of Staff, liked him, and so Marshall put Eisenhower in charge. Eisenhower was commander of Torch, and he eventually would command almost every major operation after that, including Normandy and the Supreme Allied Commander in Europe. In addition to Eisenhower, there was also Patton, of course, in Morocco. That was his first World War II combat command. There was also Eisenhower's deputy commander, Mark Clark, who would later command Fifth Army in Italy. Especially on the American side, there were quite a few uh, commanders that went into action for the first time. So a lot of firsts with um, Operation Torch. Uh, in retrospect, we all assume, oh, it went, it was, you know, smooth, easy, and they could go on and, and just fight in, in Europe. Well, it wasn't smooth and it wasn't easy. It was full of obstacles, full of mistakes. Commanders on the scene proved incompetent and they got fired right away by Eisenhower. It was a huge deal. The American army needed the lessons of North Africa to effectively go forward. As one of the veterans I've read about said, 
We needed a place to be lousy. We needed a place to try out techniques. We needed a place to be able to work out some of the issues, some of the doctrinal issues in terms of developing ourselves and techniques to go defeat the Germans in battle. Without the initial proving ground of North Africa, I don't know if the American army would have been ready to take on the Germans in France. Nous espérons qu'un jour, une force mécanique supérieure De Gaulle's broadcast uh, in 1940 was absolutely pivotal uh, in motivating, in giving permission, if you like, for the French to rise up. D'avoir la victoire et de délivrer la patrie. Pétain secured a majority for, for bidding for an armistice, at which point De Gaulle decided to leave the country. He decided to go to London to continue the struggle, and he made his famous broadcast of the 18th of June 1940, saying that the struggle must continue. Nous croyons que l'honneur des Français consiste à continuer la guerre aux côtés de leurs alliés, et nous sommes résolus à le faire. He managed to secure the confidence of Winston Churchill, and slowly he put together the free French forces uh, in order to continue the struggle. It was a long, long battle. There were lots of setbacks, but gradually he managed to get the, the free French back into the war. He makes this speech to his nation by the BBC, uh, rallying the resistance against Nazi occupation. And that's something which I think for the nation, for France as a nation, is hugely significant because for your leader to actually give you permission uh, to rise up is psychologically incredibly important. And we mustn't forget that for those that did resist Nazi occupation, their families could also die. Les Français d'Algérie avaient dans l'ensemble très bien accueilli le gouvernement de Vichy. This was the hostile atmosphere in which we, the resistors, found ourselves. The Algiers resistance was a lone endeavor, born in solitude and it had to be done in complete secrecy. How did they organize? Um, how did they meet each other? Um, how did they prepare? How did they train? How did they arm? All of these were huge obstacles. So groups of them met in, um, in health clubs, gyms, for fear that, that Vichy and their local intelligence would find them out. And one of the things they did, I mean, having been thrown out of universities, they turned up at this gym and they did a lot of, you know, bodybuilding and working out. In Algiers, the use of the Géogra gym by a group of friends, Emile Atlan, André Termim, and Charles Bouchara, was destined to lead to the creation of a Jewish self-defense group. They recruited other members under the guise of a fitness club while the owner of the gym, Géogra, would teach boxing. They hid weapons in various locations in the gym, right under the nose of Géogra, who pretended to ignore his students' activities. Later on, near the end of 1940, my cousin Raphael and his brother, Stéphane, became the leaders of the group. In theory, they were passing the time of day, but they were also forming a group of people who could resist. And I think they were also, to some extent, uh, conquering this idea that, um, you know, uh, the Jewish people was not particularly vigorous, not particularly physical. It was more intellectual, it was more urban, it was a bit fey, it was a bit dilettante. But they were going to be solid, you know, muscular uh, Jewish resistors. Abu Kaur says resistance was survival. We had to survive against the people who were trying to destroy us. Henri Dastier me dit, euh, j'ai une entente avec les Américains qui préparent un débarquement en Afrique du Nord. Est-ce que vous connaissez des gens pour aider ça à Alger, ils venaient d'Oran. Et j'ai pensé à ces petits groupes, qui étaient des groupes de résistance, mais de résistance, on ne savait pas pourquoi puisque nous n'avions pas l'armée allemande. 
Et c'est ainsi que je me suis trouvé servir de lien entre ces petits groupes de jeunes que je connaissais, qui avaient organisé des départs ou des tentatives de départ pour Londres, et Henri Dastier qui arrivait avec le contact avec Murphy. In the difficult and confusing game of deception and intrigue that preceded the landings, it was Mr. Murphy, Roosevelt's North African attaché, who skillfully played the American hand. On the 18th of October 42, Tassi and Juice arrived at my house. It was unusual. Their motive, even more so. They told us the US command was sending a delegation to secretly meet the leaders of our resistance. I was told that it was best if I don't attend this meeting, since if it turned out badly, I was the only one to know of our plans against the Vichy army and the men ready to lead it. My Parisian cousin, Bernard Carsanti, who was living with us, would go instead to assist with the military discussions. The meeting would take place at a seaside villa near Cherchel, west of Algiers. Just a couple of weeks before the Allied invasion, the, the, the famous secret meeting in Cherchel between Allied officers, General Mark Clark, and sort of the higher ranks of the overall Algerian resistance. De notre côté, il y a Mast comme chef de délégation. Il y a moi comme chef d'état-major auprès de lui. Il y a Dacier chargé des questions de, de groupement de résistance. The American submarine arrived at 1 a.m. Four kayaks took the officers to shore and the meeting started. Later that night, the Vichy police and the coast guards noticed something strange and prepared to circle the villa. Running out of time, our men tried to get their guests back on the submarine, but the sea was too rough. They hid behind the rocks and waited until the wind and the waves subsided. The younger men undressed and entered the sea again. Bernard said he would never forget the sight of those five men in their boxers at night balancing a kayak into which climbed General Clark and the captain of the American Navy in underwear. It took three hours and much effort to launch the other kayaks into the sea. What we asked before all is that the Americans don't make a embarkment militaire orthodoxe, mais un débarquement qui correspondit aux possibilités qu'on leur apportait, c'est-à-dire débarquer là où on pouvait leur assurer, n'est-ce pas, euh, l'accueil. À Cherchel, Colonel Jousse came up with the protection plan, giving the resistors a reason to disguise themselves as soldiers. We began to put his plan in action. C'est un plan dans lequel sont définies les conditions dans lesquelles la défense peut s'assurer qu'on ait des troupes intérieures ou éventuellement une intervention extérieure, n'est-ce pas Et c'est moi qui l'ai fait. Quand Jouz nous avait parlé de ce plan, euh, nous avons sauté sur l'occasion en nous disant mais on va appliquer le plan de maintien de l'ordre et personne ne pourra se rendre compte qu'il y a un soulèvement ou qu'il y a un putsch puisque nous appliquons une chose qui est prévue. Les autorités ne pourront pas s'étonner de voir des gens relever des gardes en faction ou des officiers en poste, puisque c'est dans l'application d'un plan de défense pour le cas où quelque chose d'imprévu se passerait. The Americans at one point promised them um, thousands of up-to-date rifles and handguns and grenades had no intention of delivering and never did deliver. A few days before, Murphy told me that the invasion would be on the 7th or 8th of November. Two days later, in a more precise manner, he confirmed those dates. So everything accelerated. We waited many nights for the delivery of better weapons than the old Lebel rifles that Jus gave us, but they never arrived. We were still determined. 
il dit forcément les Américains vont vouloir débarquer ici pour pouvoir faire telle ou telle action, on doit préparer cette arrivée. These were largely uh, young Jewish men who um, um, were not professionally trained soldiers, professionally trained military officers. There were supposed to be about 800 or so insurgents show up that night for the uprising. Only a few hundred showed up. Of the 388, 315 were Jewish. Albuquer and the rest of the resistance leaders, they went through with their plan anyway. Notre plan consistait à arrêter le plus possible d'officiers supérieurs et de chefs de l'administration, d'occuper les locaux dans lesquels ils se trouvaient, de couper leur communication avec l'extérieur, donc l'Afrique du Nord et avec la France. One day we learned, by accident, about the connections of the military and civil telephone lines in Algiers. There was a special line connecting the central police station to the local stations, and the idea came to me that we could intercept this line and have all communications coming through the same connection. We secretly gained access to the underground tunnels, cutting the telephone wires linking Algiers to France. I was now able to gain full control of the telephone system. I could communicate with my comrades and more importantly, the military, the local police and all government officials were now connected to me and only me. Et de maintenir ces autorités dans l'état de, de paralysie, d'anesthésie totale pendant un certain nombre d'heures permettant aux Américains de débarquer sans coup ferrir, d'investir la ville, de s'emparer de ses postes à notre place, de nous relever par conséquent à leur tour et de dire aux autorités, euh, mes enfants, nous sommes là et maintenant la guerre continue avec les Français aux côtés des Alliés. My plan and that of Jousse and Henri Dacier was completely reliant on the element of surprise. We needed cars to move uniformed men and artillery to 20 different targets in Algiers without raising suspicion. I approached Louis and Raymond Lavaïs, who owned the garage down the street from me, where I housed my Citroën. They agreed to help us with 20 or 30 cars at our disposal. On November 7, at about 10.30 p.m., the resistance leaders go, one after the other, to the Lavaïs garage, say the password whiskey soda, and are let in. Jus gives everyone the mission orders signed by him as the local commander. The order states that all the major guard posts are to be replaced. He strongly insists to not use our guns. I give out the official VP Volunteer Militia armbands. With the mission orders gathered during the day from our headquarters at 26 Michel Street, with the Lebel rifles that were in the cars, and with the armbands, the resistance leaders take their men and each group goes off to their designated target. Wartime teaches us that everything can change for the military and its leaders in days. For the fighters, on the ground, it can change in mere minutes. At midnight, we roll out of the garage, ready to fight. And so, on November 8, between midnight and 1 in the morning, 400 civilians and some reserve officers, wearing their old uniforms, in small groups, managed to replace the guard posts of all the major targets the post office, the telephone centers, the army and the living quarters of the main Vichy leaders. Shortly after midnight, I leave our headquarters with about 20 men and two senior policemen. We address those in charge of the central police station and show them the mission orders. The station is now under our control.
I take my place, not at the main desk, but at the central telephone booth. For the next hour, I receive a number of calls, and then I know at one in the morning, through various short conversations, that everything had gone exactly as planned. They show up at the homes of uh, Vichy admirals and generals and officers and arrest them in the middle of the night. Maybe one of them had a gun. Three of them would be having fake guns or would be simulating having, having weapons. Dans les minutes qui suivent, nous sommes en relation avec le groupe qui était conduit par Henri Dastier et dirigé par Bernard Pofilet, où accompagné de Murphy, on a arrêté le général Jean et l'amiral Darlan. Shortly after midnight, the group led by Bernard Pofilet and accompanied by Robert Murphy was able to enter the Olive Palace with Jules' mission orders. This was where General Juin, commander of the French land forces in North Africa, lived. Juin was promptly arrested. To everyone's surprise, Admiral François Darlan, the commander-in-chief of all the French forces, happened to be in the residence as well. He was also arrested. Soon after, Murphy started to negotiate a treaty with Darlan and Juin. En fait, à 3 heures du matin, nous savons au commissariat central que la totalité du plan prévu par le colonel Jousse a été appliqué et partout, sans la moindre difficulté et sans qu'un coup de feu ait eu à être tiré. La ville nous appartient. Our mission was only supposed to be to neutralize Algiers for two hours before the Americans landed and two hours after. Because they were late, we needed to hold our post for longer than we had planned. They held the city of Algiers for six hours. This is, this is an amazing thought. Fewer than 400 people took the entire city of Algiers and kept it under their control. Operation Torch is a very complicated operation. Just the technical aspects of getting those convoys from the United Kingdom and from the United States to get there. There are three task forces. Uh, there's the Eastern Task Force and the Center Task Force that came from Britain. The Western Task Force, which came from the United States, had the longest voyage to get to the invasion beaches of any invasion in history to that point. Between the three of them, they carried 107,000 American and British troops. The Western Task Force was entirely American. Algiers was the most important target because it was closest to Tunisia. It was closest to the Axis bases. And it was also the largest uh, city in French North Africa and the de facto capital. The landings were coordinated to take place at midnight. The Allied forces, they're the ones who missed the mark in some respects. Le général Ryder n'avançait pas. Il n'avançait pas parce qu'il n'arrivait pas à croire qu'Alger était occupé par nous, qu'il attendions, et parce que, alors ça nous ne le savions pas avant, nous l'avons su après, il avait moins de 2 000 hommes de troupes, et il savait qu'il y avait 11 à 12 000 hommes de troupes dans Alger, et il y allait doucement. They landed uh, many kilometers away from their landing zones. It took a while for them to get to Algiers. By the time they got to Algiers, the Vichy was already back in control. La reprise d'Alger se fait par l'armée sous la direction du commandant d'Orange, essentiellement par la garde mobile et ensuite par d'autres troupes qui s'y associent et qui reprennent d'abord la poste centrale en tuant l'un des nôtres, le lieutenant Dreyfus qui commandait la poste, et, et ensuite petit à petit tous les autres postes. Et à ce moment-là, ça a été très difficile. À partir de 4 heures du matin, je reçois au commissariat central des coups de téléphone, des gars qui sont dans les différents coins. L'armée arrive et nous investit. Qu'est-ce qu'on fait Est-ce qu'on tire Nous n'avions pas envie de tirer sur l'armée française. Ce n'était pas cette armée que nous faisions la guerre. Nous voulions qu'elle fasse la guerre. Je ne sais pas si les consignes que j'ai données étaient très claires, parce que j'étais très débordé. J'ai dit qu'il fallait tout faire pour ne pas tirer. Et en fait, nous n'avons pas tiré, ils ont tiré sur nous. 
Nous avons eu deux morts et des blessés. Nous avons gagné du temps. L'avant-dernier poste repris a été la préfecture, à laquelle j'ai été dans le courant de la matinée, et qui a été reprise à 11h du matin, que la garde mobile a reprise après une longue discussion et négociation avec moi, où j'ai obtenu assez bizarrement les honneurs de la guerre, c'est-à-dire que nous sortions avec les armes. Il y a un seul Américain qui est entré dans Alger à 3h du matin, et qui s'est installé dans ma chambre à coucher, et, et qui a piqué un roupillon car il était épuisé de fatigue, grâce à quoi j'ai pu raconter à tous nos hommes, il y a un Américain dans Alger. I heard that an American soldier, a young bright-eyed farm boy from the Midwest, had arrived at my house and so I made my way there. I did my best to make him feel at home. I told him that the rest of his regiment was not far behind. I smile today, proudly remembering that he was the first to take a city for the United States of America in World War II, and he was hidden in our house. But I think the, the, the resistance in Algiers did help to neutralize the Vichy regime. Delon and Juin were taken prisoner briefly. I think they were demoralized, and I suppose that strengthened the arm of the Americans to, to beat them into submission. I think you see that with Algiers, it was the most successful of the three major landings. It had the fewest Allied casualties. Algiers was taken the quickest of the three major cities. I think the main thing that made the Algiers resistance successful is they were decisive. It still worked even with just a fraction of the fighters showing up that they expected. It's also true to say that the ceasefire in Algiers happened a lot sooner than the ceasefire for uh, the whole of North Africa. So in that sense, I think the, the movement in Algiers was very significant. That six hours that they controlled the city was absolutely essential to distracting Vichy and providing the Allies entry into the most important piece of territory in the European theater of war at that moment. I have never promised anything about blood, tears, toil, and sweat. Now, however, we have a new experience. We have victory. Ah, this is not the end. Uh, it is not even the beginning of the end. Uh, but it is perhaps the end of the beginning. The Daolong deal was the deal the Americans did with Admiral Daolong who had been the prime minister of the Vichy regime in 1941. He was an extremely powerful Vichy figure. And that meant that the resistors were marginalized. They were uh, cast to one side, and indeed some of them finished up in prison. Jean-Francois Darlan happened to be in Algiers by coincidence visiting his son, who was ill with polio. The Allies managed to work out a deal with Darlan, at least for a, a ceasefire. It took Dalo a few days to decide to go with the Americans. Initially, he ordered resistance against the Allied forces. The terms between the Allies and the French were pretty decent. The Allies didn't want to treat the French as an enemy or a, a conquered belligerent. So once that was done, the Americans had their man in place who could uh, bring Vichy uh, into the war. They were happy for, for Dalon to have military control, control of the government, control of the French Empire from Algiers. The poor little resistors were, were basically um, eliminated, eliminated politically, and as I say, some of them finished up in prison. À 5 heures du soir, on est libéré. Le cessez-le-feu a sonné, et nous rentrons chez nous, heureux d'avoir réussi ce mouvement. 
La déception, par contre, est vive le lendemain. On apprend que Darlan est au pouvoir avec Giraud et nous ne comprenons absolument pas. Nous avons l'impression d'avoir été floués, d'avoir été joués, qu'on nous a utilisés, car nous, nous nous attendions à voir arriver de Gaulle. Nous étions euh, membres de la France libre. There was a huge amount of opposition in Britain to the Darlan deal. This was a, a deal with rats, you know, why, why are we making deal with rats? We're fighting for freedom, we're fighting for liberation, we're fighting for a better world. We don't, we're, not, we're, not, we're not supposed to be doing deals with horrible people like Darlan. Then on Christmas Eve 1942, Darlan was assassinated. Monsieur Jacquet, Henri d'Astier la Vigerie a-t-il été mêlé, comme certains le prétendent, à cette affaire Je ne peux pas vous répondre là-dessus. J'ai été moi-même, comme chacun sait, assez mêlé à cette affaire. C'est une affaire compliquée. Tous les résistants du 8 novembre 1942 portent une responsabilité dans cette affaire. Je pense que pour Henri Dacier, comme pour moi-même, c'est une responsabilité surtout morale. Après le Darlan deal, power passed to General Giraud. General Giraud was the man who the Americans were actually going to bring into North Africa. He was a general who had escaped from a German POW camp. And he was a very right-wing, almost pro-Vichy general. He saw no reason why he should not continue the repressive regime of Vichy in North Africa. He regarded the, the, the rebels, the, the resistors of the 8th of November, as, you know, Jewish, communist, who should be chucked into prison. And it wasn't until the Americans got wind of this that they said, well, look, you know, these people are actually on our side. They may be Jewish, they may be communists, but actually they're on our side in the war against the Axis. And so pressure was put on Giraud to let them out of prison. After the success of the Allied invasion, Aboukair goes on to very high rank in the French resistance, serves as an important uh, official for de Gaulle, eventually is recognized by um, the French government for his uh, contribution to the French resistance. He went to London, he was recruited by SOE, the Special Operations Executive. This was an organization which basically trained agents, usually agents with very interesting hybrid backgrounds who could speak local languages and who would be parachuted into France or Yugoslavia or uh, wherever it happened to be to work with the local resistance on the ground. Aboukair was parachuted into France on one of these missions. Why don't more Jews know about the resistance? Well, first of all, it's a, it's a, it's a piece of the larger question. Why don't people in general know about the uh, the war in North Africa. Um, why don't people know about the persecution of Jews in North Africa? And why don't people know about the Jewish resistance to persecution and the Jewish contribution to the war effort against uh, persecution, against Vichy, against the Nazis, against the fascists in North Africa? And thank you for joining us as we mark the 75th anniversary of Operation Torch. Operation Torch was a jointly planned U.S. and British amphibious operation in Algeria and Morocco, which marked the... I feel the reason that more people don't know about Operation Torch is because I don't think the Americans were terribly proud of it since they were killing Frenchmen and Frenchmen were killing Americans. I believe it was embarrassing to be fighting the French instead of fighting the Nazis or the Japanese. I think it's lost for a couple of reasons. It's a very complicated operation. But then on top of it all, there's the political maneuvers in terms of the free French, the Vichy French. And then the other big thing is we're not, in Torch, we're not fighting the Germans. We're fighting the French. And I don't think it's something that the French necessarily want to remember. I don't think it's something a lot of people necessarily want to remember. And it's, it's kind of skipped over because of that to focus on the Tunisia campaign, the Sicily campaign, and, and the other ones that follow after that. So it's, it's a complicated fight. It's, it's a complicated campaign. Politically, it's very murky and muddy, but that doesn't mean it's not essential. If we lost in North Africa almost a year after Pearl Harbor, 
then it would have been truly demoralizing. And one of the critical things to come out of Operation Torch was the fact that we took prisoners of war, our first large scale prisoners of war, and they were brought back to England. And we gleaned intelligence from that that was absolutely crucial to the outcome of the war. If Torch had failed, we would have had to either go back against a stronger defense in North Africa, or we would have then had no choice but to go across the channel right into the teeth of the German army in 1942-43, before it had been severely weakened like it was by 1944. A case can certainly be made for those resistance fighters shortening the North Africa campaign, and of course the American forces and British forces ultimately outflanking the German forces, uh, Rommel asking for reinforcements, and of course Hitler not taking any notice of him. That's interestingly one of the things that comes out of some of the bugged conversations. Those generals in North Africa, they, they said once in captivity, you know, if Hitler had listened to us, we wouldn't have lost North Africa. <laughs> and so Operation Torch and the 8th of November is a, is a turning point. It was a dramatic movement of resistance and it was a statement. This is a very interesting document drafted by Heinz Rothke, uh, who was head of the Jewish department in Paris. This is quite good evidence of how wary and indeed concerned uh, the Nazis were about the magnitude and the importance of Jewish resistance in France and in North Africa. Generally, North Africa is a sideshow. Generally, World War II is viewed in the European theater as a, as a solely European story. But one doesn't appreciate, one doesn't understand the European story without understanding what happened in North Africa. North Africa was integral to the war effort. Algiers actually had an impact on the war effort. Indeed, it's the only Jewish resistance movement that really had an impact on the war effort and in the process saved American lives. That's a sort of a double um, uh, impact that certainly no other Jewish resistance movement can claim. What perception do we have of Jewish resistance fighters? I mean, do we even think there were any? It's a very interesting thing because we often think of Jews as the victims, and of course they absolutely were, six million, but ultimately this is important. You know, there would have been more than six million Jews, for example, who would have been murdered had the resistance fighters not done their bit. Abu Kher, over time, he doesn't achieve the status of well-recognized hero among um, Jewish historians or uh, people looking back on, on this, this episode. Il était compagnon, était reconnu, mais le 8 novembre 42, c'est considéré comme secondaire, si vous voulez, et il n'a rien fait pour euh, se mettre en avant. Chance put me in charge of four of the five major resistance groups. After the fact, I got called their leader. In fact, I wasn't the leader of anything. I was in the middle of a bunch of guys whom I helped and consulted with. Some said that I was a natural leader. I would disagree. My understanding is that over the years, um, Abu Kher, um took a different political path which isolated him from the main thrust of the French Jewish community. And so lots of things came together to, to marginalize the contribution that he played uh, in this very important moment in time. When De Gaulle was enterrée with his compagnons, he was there and he said he cried. Ce qui comptait pour lui, c'était vraiment être compagnon de la libération. What motivated the resistors? Were they acting as Frenchmen or were they acting as Jews? My view is, yes, they acted as Frenchmen, French patriots. Their French patriotism was insulted and was 
persecuted because of their Jewishness. On November 8, 1942, for one night and one day, 400 volunteers of different classes and backgrounds, but united in their love of France, held off the Vichy army until the Americans arrived. These patriots sacrificed without prejudice or hostility. Patriots of all opinions love their country. Nationalism, on the other hand, is a competitive patriotism. Love for country is expressed inversely, through the hatred of others, other countries, other people, other races. It is the far right, led by someone like Hitler or Mussolini, that will use aggression against those it hates. Patriotism, nationalism, they are like day and night. Love and hate. It was true French patriotism that gave birth to the Algerian resistance of the Second World War.